I was eight years old, riding a high fueled by pink cotton candy and the adrenaline rush from just having ridden the swinging car of the Coney Island Wonder Wheel. The cool breeze of the Atlantic Ocean was brushing through my hair. Then, my father and I headed to the Spookorama, a haunted house that I had ridden plenty of times with my father, a groovy cat of the 1970s who wore his sideburns long and his wavy black hair longer. My dad wrote Dylan-esque ballads about peace and freedom while smoking his daily bale of weed. <laughs> he paid the bills through a variety of jobs, most of which were legal. He didn't love the Spookorama because he thought that us kids could use less horror and more love. But I enjoyed the ride. Just the two of us in a little barrel cart together. And it was plenty scary, too. Bats flew so low that we could fear the, feel their rubbery wings slap against our foreheads. Then Dracula's coffin rose into an upright position and popped open and said, the vampire said, who dares enter the Spookorama? <laughs> Riding the Spookorama with my dad was easy, though. He made jokes and he laughed at the monsters. He called them uptight. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> but when the doors of the Spookorama opened and the bright light of the real world shined in, I wasn't ready for the fun to end. Dad reminded me that Coney Island was a big place and that there was lots more to do and see. We could eat caramel popcorn, we could sample fudge, or he suggested that we could just head down to the beach and feel each other's vibes. <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, I'm eight years old, Daddy. I do not have vibes. <laughs> then a brilliant idea. I asked him, how about if I ride the Spookorama alone and you go get some candy and wait outside? All right, he said. You're old enough to make decisions about your life. This is the 70s. <laughs> so, so I did. Before the doors of the Spookorama closed behind me, I took one last look at my father standing outside in the sunshine, unwrapping a piece of blue saltwater taffy from its wax paper wrapping. Then the doors closed, and everything was pitch black. I had forgotten about the long corridor of darkness before the ride really got going. I shrieked when those disgusting bats touched my head. And at the sight of Dracula, I let out a blood-curling scream. It was a scream that involved every part of my body. My toes stiffened and splayed. My neck looked like tree roots. My lips tingled from being stretched so wide. I was terrified. And then I heard a loud thud and the screech of metal scraping against metal. My cart came to a complete stop and the witch stopped stirring her cauldron and then froze and dropped her head like she was embarrassed. Before I could consider what was happening, Bright lights switched on, and the spook house transformed into what looked like an empty parking lot. There were wires coming from Frankenstein's hands. Dracula was hooked up to some sort of power box, and the bats were strips of cloth like what you'd see in a car wash. <laughs> Seconds later, I heard my father's voice calling my name in a panic. It was very loud and very clear, the call was coming from inside the spook house. <laughs> Another man's voice followed, calling for him to stop. In a flash, my father was by my side, begging me to stay inside the cart. These things are on a rail. If you jump out of the car, you could be electrocuted. A man in an oil-stained Captain Crunch t-shirt caught up to him. <laughs> are you? Are you fucking crazy, man? You can't just run into the Spookorama like that. You get yourself killed. My dad explained that he was terrified that I'd get out of the cart. I'm sorry, brother. You got kids? The ride operator sighed heavily and waved a hand. Pops do all kinds of crazy shit for our kids, don't we? 
And then miraculously, he hugged my father and told him to get into the cart. And no more of this Captain fucking America shit, all right? A girl needs her daddy around. It didn't seem like a good time to tell the fathers bonded in their embrace that it had never once occurred to me to get out of the cart. <laughs> I knew not to mention this. And on some level, I knew that I should never mention it. I mean, really, what was the harm of maintaining a little lie that made my father feel so good about himself, so heroic? Ten years later, he was diagnosed with lung cancer and was told that he had maybe six months to live. About three months in, he was a skeleton with a thin layer of pale skin draped over his bones. The cartilage of his jaw eroded and his bottom lip and his chin slipped an inch to the side of his oversized skull. He looked like a prisoner at a Nazi concentration camp clinging to survival. His body was eroding, but his mind remained as sharp as any other man in his 40s. He had very strong opinions about the new music of the 80s. Most of all, it was shit. <laughs> he, still he still enjoyed fine food and good weed. Lung cancer be damned. And he still loved to tell stories. Dad lamented that all anybody wanted to talk to him about anymore was his health. It's like I'm the all-cancer network. I want to talk about other things while I'm still here. Did I ever tell you that I was the captain of the Brooklyn College soccer team and I played the second half of a big game with a sock stuffed in my split lip? Sitting on a bench in his sister's blooming backyard, he continued, I scored the winning goal with a sock stuffed in my lip because some guy kicked me in the face and he split my lip open. Seeing my confusion, he explained, you see, the game isn't over for me, and I am so sick of this cancer shit. Can we just, can we just pretend it's not happening? It was now my turn to run into the dark for him, to show him that this world of horror he had entered was just an illusion. It was a lie, but it felt like a gift for the both of us. We could create a bubble, a private world where he was fine. It was our own Spookorama barrel cart, but on a very different ride. This was a fun house that my father created, and the mirrors were distorted to make us look better. For his birthday, he invited some of his junkie friends over, and they partied on hospital-grade end-of-life medication. <laughs> At his funeral, I comforted neighbors from his apartment building, devoid of any feeling. His friends cried, and our family tied black cloths around their sleeves. And I comforted them with trite consolations about him being in a better place and his memory being a blessing. One person actually mistook me as an employee of the funeral home rather than the daughter of the deceased. I knew I should have felt grief, but I couldn't. It wasn't that I was fighting it back. I was unable to feel anything because I had cauterized the artery that could experience his loss, and I had no idea how to undo it. I wasn't even sure I wanted to. In our world, loving someone meant bending reality to protect them, sometimes even convincing yourself of a better truth. It was voluntarily gaslighting yourself just a bit to pretend that, yes, I was going to jump out of the cart of the Spookorama. You saved my life. And no, you don't have cancer. You're not going to die. Everything is just fine. Acknowledging that everything wasn't fine would have been a betrayal. I was supposed to keep running down a soccer field with a sock in my lip. Not only that, I had to score the winning goal that way. It took five years before I cried over my father's death when a boyfriend told me that he loved hearing stories about my dad and couldn't wait to meet him. I couldn't imagine why such a nice guy would say such a callous thing. When I reminded my boyfriend that my father had died five years earlier, 
he was shocked. He swore I never told him. With the absolute conviction of somebody who was telling the truth, my boyfriend said that I talk about my father in the present tense. He assumed my father was alive and well. No, he's not. My father is dead. To this day, I don't know if the tears that followed were from the grief of saying the words or the pain of having never spoken them before. And I suppose it doesn't matter. But at that moment, a new reality set in and my world shifted. There are all kinds of palliative care and they all cost something, whether it's a hospital bill or an emotional toll. For my father, it was running into the dark, the first time willingly and the second time out of desperation. For me, it was jumping into the cart with him, both lovingly and selfishly. Neither of us wanted to be on this scary ride at all, much less alone. So we clung to each other's willingness to comfort one another, to anesthetize ourselves from reality. For better and for worse, we finished both rides together. Thank you. Give it up for Jennifer Coburn, everybody.